recording here. So. Okay, so um, I can charge somebody. So first point, Cynthia, is I can charge somebody more than 5%, but I better have some good reasons. There are good reasons and there are bad reasons. Uh, how about Cynthia, you're the last trade of the broker month and I got to make it up on someone. No. How about you're particularly high maintenance as a customer, so for you, up 200% on the commission schedule? Uh, no. So the first part of this uh, policy is that broker dealers have to have a normal pattern to their charges, a commission schedule. We just can't be making it up on the fly what we're going to charge people. Second uh, major point of this is if we depart from our normal pattern, we've got to have good reasons for doing so. Now, uh, there are two legends in our business. Uh, one is Charles Schwab, the founder of Schwab, and the other is uh, Ricketts, the founder of TD Ameritrade. And up until 1975, commissions were fixed. And it didn't matter where you bought stock from. All of us, Cynthia, would charge you 2%. So if you bought $100,000 from Merrill Lynch, it's going to be 2000 bucks. And if you bought $100,000 from Morgan Stanley, it's going to be $2,000. And so the original purpose of the 5% rule was when commissions were fixed, 2%, 2% is 4%, let's call 5% uh, reasonable. And that's our second part is whatever you are charging has to be fair and reasonable. And this is kind of the guideline. Uh, this is only for secondary transactions, this policy or guideline. Very testable, it doesn't apply to the primary market. Because remember, in the primary market, we're going to give you a prospectus. And on the front page, we show you exactly what that's going to be. In the primary market, you know, it's typically 10% would be as high as 10, usually about seven. But mutual funds, remember, by legislation are eight and a half. So it doesn't apply to anything in the primary market. Or another way to say that is anything with a prospectus. We're using a prospectus where we actually tell you on the front page what that markup is, it doesn't apply. So it applies to the primary market. And in the, uh, it doesn't apply to the primary market, it applies to the secondary market. And we're, whether we're charging you a commission or whether we're charging you a markup or markdown. So let's talk about broker dealers. You know, broker dealers make money through transactions. You know, I tell you, I said, Cynthia, we are a broker dealer. We're all called broker dealers. We're all member firms of FEMRA. And uh, as a broker dealer, the way we get paid is when you do a transaction. Now, Cynthia, you work for a company that is uh, really ethically sound or compared to a lot of other firms. And what I mean by that is there's a lot of uh, things that Fidelity could do if they chose to, but they don't. Now, I think it's easier to be ethically uh, squared away when you have a lot of money. I'm joking, but you know. So for example, Cynthia Fidelity doesn't receive payment for order flow when it's uh, doing tr uh, trades on behalf of its clients, acting as an agent for its clients. That's hundreds of millions of dollars that Fidelity could make if they chose to do that. You know, Schwab receives payment for order flow, nothing wrong with that, but they have what are called preference market makers. Now I say in the transactions I'm gonna do with you, we're either going to be acting in our broker agency capacity or our dealer principal capacity. And this comes up not so much on the New York Stock Exchange because that's an auction order driven market. Where this typically comes up is when I'm making a market, I'm a market maker in a NASDAQ stock. So let's say I'm a market maker at Goldman Sachs. Now, the GSCO is a Goldman Sachs uh, vanity license plate number. I'm joking. It's called a market participant ID. So we're looking at a screen, a quote screen, right? Because the over-the-counter markets, NASDAQ, stands for National Association of Securities Dealers Automated Quotation System. And whether it's NASDAQ or not NASDAQ, over-the-counter markets can best be characterized, test question is negotiated quote-driven markets. And so, you know, what's going to happen here is at Goldman, I'm going to post my bid and I'm going to post my ask. And then I'm going to post my size. So I'm posting my quote and let's say I post a uh, 15, 16. And the minimum size I can actually quote, the minimum size I can actually quote would be 100. 
That's my minimum obligation as it relates to uh, being a market maker. I'll say 10 by 10. And so what this means is that if I'm working at Goldman Sachs, I say, Cynthia, Goldman Sachs is willing to buy 10 round lots into its inventory at 15 and willing to sell 10 round lots out of its inventory at 16. So that bidding ask is from the market maker's perspective. I think a good way to remember it is the customer is always going to be paying the high price and always receiving the low price. In fact, let's just put that here in terms of this. Now, when we're talking about the 5% policy, if you're an agent, it's always based on the total dollar amount. So if you're buying the stock, let's say you buy 100 shares, that's going to be $1,600. And I would take the commission and divide it. You're not going to have to do the math on this on your Series 7, but you do have to have a general understanding of what, what it means. And so here, let's just uh, put this here. Market maker buys. And here, market makers. Now, there would be other market makers in this security. You know, so if, uh, if we're looking, for example, if we're looking at a level two NASDAQ data feed, a level two NASDAQ data feed would show uh, fidelity all the various market makers in the securities. And so in this particular security, maybe we find out that uh, not only does uh, Goldman make a market in this security, but perhaps Morgan Stanley does as well. That's Morgan Stanley's uh, trading ticker. And so they're on the screen and they would have a bid in an ask. And let's say that uh, their bid is 1505. And let's say their ask is 1605. And they too have to be good for at least 100 shares. And so I would have a general understanding that the 5% policy is based on test question, the inside market or the inside quote. Do you know yet based on pre-study what the inside market or inside quote is? It is the highest bid and the lowest ask. And so we have a level one data feed. It would tell us 1505, 16. That is the highest bid and the lowest ask. And then the size would be whatever, let's say here it's eight by eight. And so here, let me move you guys' pictures over here. Uh, eight by eight, and that would be our size. And so the level one NASDAQ data feed would show, let's put level one over here. It would show the highest bid and the lowest ask, which in this case is 1505. Uh, by the way, these uh, market makers have to be able to enter quotes. And so there we'd have what we call level three NASDAQ data feed, which would actually let them enter quotes. And the size here is gonna be eight by 10. So and this is the 5% policy, as we said, applies to the markup or markdown to what we call the inside market. Again, I'm not gonna make you calculate this, but let me just give you an example of this, uh, eight by 10. So uh, if, I, uh, if I'm Goldman Sachs in this scenario, Cynthia, and I buy that in stock into my inventory at 15, for purposes of the markdown, that's a nickel markdown because the highest bid was 1505. And I bought it into my inventory at 15, so that my markdown is five cents. If we took the five cents divided by 15, that would be the percentage. As I said, we're not gonna make you do that. But uh, that's what that 5% policy is about. It's about trading uh, either as an agent or a principal and again, it's a policy. It's not a rule. It's for guidance. It's for guidance. By the way, in 1975, when we unfixed commissions and said you, we could charge whatever you want, Schwab and Ricketts were the first guys who say, okay, well, if we don't have to charge people, you know, 2%, we won't. <laughs> no. And thus was born the discount brokerage business, which discount brokers were considered pariahs for, for many, many years there from the late 70s to the early 80s. And then everybody said, well, maybe they're onto something there. Uh, one other point, if uh, I'm Goldman Sachs and you're an order entry firm and you call me and you say, Ed, what's your quote? And I say 15, 16, 10 by 10. And you say, uh, we're selling a thousand shares. 
Jen Ranelitz. And I say, eh, changed my mind. Very testable, even more testable than the 5% policy is what do we call it when a market maker fails to honor a firm quote? Very testable. That's called backing, backing away. away. That is very much a test question. Backing away. That's why a market maker fails to honor their quote. All quotes are considered firm for 100 shares, but if I show you size, then I got to honor size, right? So I, at least 100, but if I'm showing 10 by 10, I got to honor that 10 by 10. So you say, Dean, are you backing away? I say, yeah, what are you going to do about it? So what do you do if uh, you want to turn somebody in for something? You don't scare me unless you know what to do. You say, Dean, I'm contacting FINRA's Department of Enforcement. I say, ooh, never mind, you're Phil. So the Department of Enforcement test question is where you would lodge a trade practice complaint. And then the Department of Enforcement will call me and say, hey, Dean, we've got some reports that you're failing to honor your quotes. Could you come up here and explain yourself? And then what can FINRA's Department of Enforcement do to me? You're absolutely right, Caesar. That's called the code of procedure. I think that's a good way to remember it, the cop. If you do bad things, the cop is going to show up, right? <laughs> so the Department of Enforcement, can they throw me in jail? No, FINRA does not have a badge and a gun. Test question, FINRA is a self-regulatory organization. So they can fine me, they can censure me, they can suspend me, they can bar me, but they cannot throw me in jail. Is there any other further clarification, Cynthia, on this 5% policy you would like? That's perfect, Dean. Okay, and so- It's really helpful to know it's, it's more of like a guideline. Yeah, exactly it. right. And then the, it's mm -hmm. kind of a really weird question, uh, you know, just while we're talking about it. Uh, you know, another organization uh, that shows up on the exam is called the MSRB, the Municipal Securities Rulemaking Board. And every once in a while, when you encounter a funky question about the MSRB and the MSRB doesn't have a 5% policy. It's very much the same rule, but their rule just says whatever you're charging should be fair and reasonable. They don't actually have a 5% guideline. Right, so stupid, but testable. The MSRB says we don't have a number, just whatever it is, it should be fair and reasonable. And by the way, the other thing I would add, Cynthia, is it's always in after the fact, somebody's going to look back and you know make a decision where you were fair and reasonable. So you almost in the back of your mind got to be running a time clock and saying, okay, I'm about to make a decision. And somebody in the future is going to be looking back at this moment and deciding whether I was fair and reasonable. Uh, I sometimes, Cynthia, would say to a customer and document it as well. But uh, Cynthia, do you think that was fair and reasonable? You know, because what yeah. I'm looking for the customer to say is yes, so that at least later in the future, I can say, you know, I, I still, I'm still demented, Cynthia. I've been doing this for so long that I still sometimes conduct myself like I'm in the securities industry. I'm not, but this guy is, uh, was surprised that he, he said, Dean, I can't believe you just sent me an email that, why did you send me the email? We just had a telephone conversation. And I said, well, that was my way, Doug, of memorializing that phone conversation. Because, you know, when, who knows what happens in the future? You know, you may forget what we said and I may forget what we said and you know, you know, I don't wish you any ill will, but you know, you are authorized to tell me what you just told me, but there might be some new guy someday. And, you know, then he's going to tell me that I can't do what I'm doing. And so I want to be able to say, Hey, the previous guy, I, I think he was a little shocked. I was kind of talking about him in the past tense, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so you, know uh, you know, I, so if I think there's going to be something, sometimes we call those uh, Cynthia happy letters or a uh, big boy or big girl letters where we send a letter to the customer and say, listen, uh, the big boy, big girl letter is, you know, don't cry if something goes south because we just told you. Uh, by the mm -hmm. way, it's a red flag. If you start getting a lot of these letters from your broker, it means they're getting concerned, right? Sometimes we call them happy letters. So I can tell FINRA, I say, I don't know when our relationship went south, but I know that on March 27th at 3 p.m., we were cool. And they say, how do you know that? I said, I got a letter <laughs> that said, hey, we're cool, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> all right, what else would you like to talk about? Uh, yeah, that's at CYA. So uh, Caesar's a retired military folks and uh, I'm uh, not retired military, but I was a Marine and CYA is cover your butt, you know, make sure you <laughs> cover your, your butt. All right, anything, uh, what else today? Do we have a short day here today on our office hour? I know that Erica had uh, Daisy. Is there anything from your Uniform Securities Act you'd like to discuss? I know that's what you're working for. I did get your email and I will respond to getting you that practice exam I spoke to you about. And I think I recorded our session. I will send you 
your recorded session. I, I didn't get a chance to do that yet either. Thank you. I kind of wanted to see if to go over like a balance sheet. Sure, sure. That'd be good for everybody. Okay, let me grab. Stop share. Share screen. Let me see if I can go find us a balance sheet. Exit full screen. Uh, on your exam, by the way, this is testable on seven. I know some of you guys are doing seven, uh, but this is also testable on the seven. But on the 65, this is uh, testable on uh, two levels. It's testable as a balance sheet uh, for our customer, as well as a, a balance sheet for uh, the company. Okay, so first point is, can you guys see my screen? Do you see the balance sheet on the screen? Yes, you're good. Okay. All right, so uh, here's a balance sheet of ABC. This is a balance sheet of ABC at a particular moment in time. So a snapshot. You know, as I said, we do this with customers too. I say, hey, Daisy, for me to do a really good job for you over time, I need to know a lot about you. And one thing that I would be think would be informative is uh, as we start our journey together to just go over your assets, your current assets, things cash or things you plan to turn to cash within 12 months, uh, go over your long-term assets, uh, then go over on the other side of our balance sheet. That's why it's called a balance sheet because it should balance your current liabilities, things you need to pay within the next 12 months, current liabilities. Uh, go over your long-term liabilities and then uh, establish your net worth. Establish your net worth. And then what we're hoping is we revisit this. Uh, you know, we can uh, incre increase this uh, net worth number. Now, this is a publicly held company. We're assuming it is on the test. This is ABC. ABC is going to report quarterly its financial statements. The financial statements would include the balance sheet, the income statement, and a statement of cash flow. So we're going to get three 10 Qs. Those are our quarterly reports. We're going to get a 10 K. That's the annual report. And that one is audited. So that includes the fourth quarter as well as year end results. And, you know, I had a, yeah, a friend of mine, I'm no longer a practitioner, but she was worried about a particular investment. I said, well, before you make a decision, why don't we wait to get the next quarterly report and see what's going on? You know, we'll have a kind of a look in on what's happening this last three months. And then we will be more informed in making this decision. You know, I think it's worth it to kind of hang around and hang out a little bit longer just to see what the, the quarter looks like. Okay, so uh, as we go over this balance sheet, uh, we said that it is testable no current assets. Cash are things I plan to turn to cash within 12 months. So cash, accounts receivable, inventory. Now, we don't want to have to sell our inventory at a price or a markdown. We don't want to have an inventory reduction sale because that would be no good. Because if we have an inventory reduction sale, we're not gonna get what we'd like. So our first test question is we need to know what are called the quick assets. And so the quick assets are the current assets minus the uh, inventory. So in our example here, let me get a smaller font. And sometimes uh, what they do is they make you pick it out of this. So what I mean is they're gonna show you these accounts and then you're the one who has to figure out what the quick assets are. So in our example, we're looking at 40 million in current assets. And we're gonna take out of that the inventory because we don't wanna have to do, a, do an inventory reduction sale. And so that means our current assets are 40 million, but our quick assets is 20 million. And we're also gonna need that be, uh, as well because we're gonna do some uh, division. By the way, if you can't decide what math to do, you should do division. And if you can't decide what to divide, you're gonna take the first thing and divide it by the second thing. Now, fixed assets, we have buildings and furniture. We don't think we're gonna be turning that to cash. I mean, we can. Maybe we decide to sell our building and you know move somewhere else. Uh, we don't expect we're gonna sell our land. These are longer term investments. So we have 15, five million in uh, total fixed assets. Goodwill is our brand. So, you know, I told you guys, I appreciate you joining me on my journey in social media about two years ago. I began a social media thing, and I hope you guys uh, get to know me a little bit because some people don't know me at all. I've never had haters until I was social media. And 
And they say, oh, that guy is so egotistical. He refers to himself in the third person as the Series 7 guru. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> I, I laugh because I guess it's not clear that that's just kind of a branding play. It's not really that I think of myself as, it bugs me too. I, you know, I was just watching, I'm an NBA fan and I get aggravated with the player talking about to him about himself and the third player, <laughs> third person. But anyway, so what is the Series 7 brand, a guru brand worth? You know, and you know, this one I could fudge, right? This would be, you know, I could say I'm a millionaire because that brand's worth a million. This is goodwill. For example, uh, I only will eat uh, Oreo cookies. What's that worth? It's worth something. This could be patents. It could be the brand. Uh, what are the golden arches worth? You know, I don't know what the golden arches are worth, but, you know, the brand McDonald's, it's, I don't think it's a great burger, but it's worth something. If you're traveling somewhere, you kind of know what you're going to get. So we have a total here of 100 million. Current liabilities we care about. Current liabilities are things we're going to pay within the next 12 months. So we have accounts payable, we have wages, and we have taxes payable. So we have co-current liabilities of 10 million. So one of the uh, balance sheet equations you're held accountable for is called working capital. And you know, if I ask what is your working capital, I'm asking what are your current assets minus your current liabilities, whether you're a corporation or and so the working capital here would be 40 million, right? That's our current assets. And we're gonna minus our current liabilities, which was 10 million. And test question, the working capital of this company is 30 million. Uh, by the way, more often than not, I'm not gonna ask you to do it as much as I'm gonna ask you to recognize the math, right? So don't get me wrong. I mean, they could ask you to do this math, uh, Daisy, but more often than not, what they're gonna ask you is to recognize the math. You know, a company's current assets minus its current current liabilities could best be described as you got to come up with working capital. You know, uh, liquidity is important. I know Daisy that as I get older, you know, I was talking about my haters on social media, they could call me the old dude. I've embraced that. Yeah, I'm the old dude. You know? <laughs> but I found that I like having higher levels of liquidity. It makes me feel good to have a bunch of money in the bank. And it's so different than when I was younger. I didn't really care about how much money I had in the bank because I was more interested in my long-term assets. Again, if it's a customer, we got to know what kind of liquidity they're comfortable with, right? So the next thing we're going to have to do is we're going to do some ratios. We're going to do what's called the current ratio. And we're going to do what's called the quick ratio. Now, I would tell you that if you can't decide what to do on the exam, you should divide. And if you can't decide what to divide, take the first number and divide it by the second number. And so most of the test on math on the test is division. You know, I was just talking to my friend, Brian Lee. I don't think it'll be out in time for you, Daisy, but we're laying down our Series 65 podcast and we have three episodes uh, done. And I was telling uh, Brian that I wish more people, Daisy, would pay attention to this balance sheets math because this math is a lot easier than some of the other math you might encounter on your 65. So what I, I would tell people is if we can run up the score here in terms of these questions, that will pay the price to be able to assign something else to the universe, so to speak. Uh, this is testable on seven as well, but not as testable as it is on 65. And I think some of you will be taking a 66. It'll be testable there as well. So do you know, based on pre-study interview, what the current ratio is gonna be? Anybody know what the current ratio is? That's the current assets divided by the current liabilities. And again, you should be able to recognize that as a test taker. You should be able to recognize that as a test taker. So as I said, a lot of times the question is gonna be recognition, right? And what I mean by that is they put uh, A, B, C, D, and they say, which of the following best describes current ratio and you choose A, current assets divided by current liabilities. Now here, if we do this for our company that we're looking at, it would be 40 million divided by 10 million. And so we have a four to one current ratio. We have $4 in current assets for every dollar we have in current liabilities. And to be honest with you, that's pretty healthy. We're not gonna test you on what's a good number or a bad number, it's just, you know, uh, the number. The four to one is pretty, pretty healthy. All right. So as we said, we do not want to have to sell off our inventory to pay our bills. So the quick or acid test ratio means we're going to do the same math, but now we're not going to count the inventory. 
So to do the quicker acid test ratio, we're gonna take the quick assets. And again, I said, it's mainly recognition. We take the quick assets, we're gonna divide by the current liabilities. And let's call this uh, choice B. And if I ask you what best describes the acid test or quick ratio, you would say B. Now, my, my guess is as a test taker, if they ask you quick ratio, they're not gonna use quick, uh, they're gonna use acid test if they have quick assets in the, in the, in the answer set. Okay, so for our example, uh, we're gonna take 20 million. Uh, that's important, how did Dean get to 20 million? How did Dean know that the quick assets are 20 million? Because we did that. Subtracted the here. inventory. Yeah, right. We did that over there, right? So be careful because on the test, uh, on debrief, uh, on your 65, 66, Daisy, uh, I've had people tell me they actually give you the accounts. Like they say, a ABC has 5 million in cash, $15 million in accounts receivable, 20 million in inventory. And then they go on to tell you about the liabilities. And then they say, what is the quick ratio? And then you have to go back and toss out that inventory and uh, do that. You know, uh, more often than not, as I mentioned, it's mainly recognition, but you know, it just depends on your draw. I had a guy, uh, <laughs> he was a serious math geek and you know, I thought he was kind of funny. He said, Dean, I don't want to spend my money on tutoring for math because I'm a math guy and you can give me any two numbers and I can solve for the third. So, you know, we're not going to be doing any math in the session. So just skip that. And I said, fine, you know, Anyways, uh, he did pass, but he called me because, Dean, you know, I, I am a math guy, but they didn't ask me to do the math. They asked me to recognize the math. And he said, I did get a little wobbly there because I didn't memorize any of the formulas or anything. I said, well, I wish I was like you. I have to memorize the formulas and do it a half a dozen times before I can actually you know, come up with the right answer. So, all right. So we're working our way through our balance sheet. And uh, the other thing we uh, get asked about is capitalization. You know, and uh, equity always precedes debt. Equity always precedes debt. So, when, you know, when we have the corporate form of ownership, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to issue some common stock. We're going to issue some common stock. And then we might issue some bonds as well. And so our equity, the two types of capitalization are equity and debt. And that's going to be our long-term debt. So that's how we're going to capitalize our corporation. If we're conservative, uh, maybe we don't have any uh, anything other than uh, equity. You know, I, my brother is uh, going off off the grid, and uh, kind of fun. I was having a conversation with him, and I said, "Well, Chris, I thought the whole point of going off the grid is not to have any debt. You know, you could live or well, live free or whatever you want to call it." And because he was talking about was he going to finance, uh, you know, this cabin or what he's going to do, and and I said, "Well, Chris, one thing I want to tell you: if you're going off the grid." You can't go bankrupt if you don't owe anybody any money. You know, it's kind of hard to go bankrupt if you don't owe anybody any money. So I would suggest that you should just suck it up and, you know, finance this out of pocket. Anyways, I, I guess that was a new revelation for me. I said, wow, I never thought of that. <laughs> I said, hey, good news for you. The bank of Big Brother is open and serving. I'm more than happy. To, uh, you know, I'm liquid enough. If, you know, you want to borrow that from me, uh, you know, I'm more than happy to help you out and, that way it won't be like a, a loan that shows up anywhere. It'll just be between us and, and I'm in too. I'll put a cabin there next to my, my brother, park mom with you. Uh, so long-term liabilities, uh, very testable here again. So we issued, a, at one point in the primary market, we issued $50 million worth of bonds. And we're paying 8%. That's called the nominal yield, the fixed or stated rate of return. You know, that's what that's called, the coupon nominal yield fixed or stated rate of return. What will we call it on the test? Whatever you're not prepared for. These uh, bonds uh, are 20 years and they're convertible at $50 a share. So one thing we need to understand is we look at ABC here, there's a potential for dilution because the people who own those bonds, if they want, can convert it into stock at $50 a share. Now, one thing that we want to be able to know is what is the conversion ratio? So whenever we're given a conversion price, we need to establish a conversion ratio. So we want to know how much potential stock can be issued because at the end, they're going to say, do you want your thousand dollars back par or do you want X number of shares of the stock? Does anybody know how we're going to establish the conversion ratio? We're going to take par, we're going to take par 
And we're going to divide that by the conversion price. So we're going to take par 1,000. We're going to divide by the conversion price, which is 50. And uh, I am arithmetically challenged, so I'm going to use my calculator. 1,000 divide by 50. And so we find out the conversion ratio is 20 shares. So uh, let's just see now uh, how much potential dilution that is. Let's just see how much potential dilution that is. So uh, I'm taking 50 million and I'm dividing that by par to see how many bonds are out there. So that is 50,000 in bonds, right? And uh, 50,000 bonds, each of which can be converted into 20 shares. And so we're looking at a potential another million shares there in uh, potential uh, dilution. So uh, main point there on your exam, the main point there is to know this uh, conversion ratio. All right, well, moving on, we should definitely know that par value for bonds is 1,000 and par value for preferred is 100. We should definitely know that. Now that preferred stock test question has preferential treatment in two areas. Anybody know based on pre-study, the preferential treatment the preferred stock has as compared to the common stock? Very testable. Voting rights and... Well, not voting rights, separate test question, Caesar. Preferred stock test question has no voting rights. No voting rights. So preferred stock test question has no voting rights. That's not a preference. I'm asking how come it's called preferred stock? There are two reasons it is called preferred stock. It's similar during, to the common. Yep. Is it because uh, whenever you're like liquidating, they get paid before common there you stock? Go. It's a senior security. That's exactly what I'm looking for. So preferred stock, if we liquidate, nobody assumes we're going to you know, sell off all these assets and pay off all these liabilities. But you know, capitalism without you know failure is kind of like religion without hell. And so we do have a theoretical liquidation value of the business, theoretical, because we don't assume we're gonna do it, but sometimes we do. You know, we're, we're liquidating right now, uh, Silicon Valley Bank, right? And uh, we talked about par value and I said, par value is very important. We said for preferred stock, uh, that is a thousand. But another thing that we might be interested in uh, particularly if we're UBS bidding for Credit Suisse or First Citizens and we're bidding for Silicon Valley Bank, well, whatever's left is what's called the book value. And book value represents the theoretical liquidation value of the business. And I said, you know, unless we're going bankrupt, that's not going to be an issue, but, right? And so, you know, if we're practitioner, practitioners of fundamental analysis, we might be interested in that book value, uh, but it has preferential treatment in liquidation, it's ahead of the common. What's the other way that preferred stock has preferential treatment as compared to the common? So far, we got preferential treatment in liquidation that is a senior security to the common, junior to the long-term debt, but senior to the common. What's the other way it has preferential treatment? In dividends. You cannot pay a dividend to the common stockholders if you're in arrears if you're in arrears to your per, uh, preferred stockholders. Now here, they don't tell us on this balance sheet, I'll just put a number here. Let's say this is a 6% preferred. So that's 6%, the reason PAR is so important is because you gotta be able to test to be able to tell me that you recognize that that is based on PAR and that's gonna be $6 because that 6% is based on PAR. So if you have this preferred stock, we're going to be expecting $6 as an annual dividend. Do you get that $6 once a year, that annual dividend? Is it paid annually to you? Semi-annually. And quarterly. Oh. Quarterly. Stocks pay, if they pay at all, quarterly. Semi-annually is an answer to a different question. What pays semi-annually? Those bonds. Right, those bonds pay semi-annually. These bonds that we were looking up here are going to be J and J, or F and A. They pay, you know, every six months. Stocks pay quarterly. So here I would be getting six dollars uh, annually, and I would be getting a dollar fifty quarterly. 
Okay, so one more Daisy uh, test question here, uh, based on the balance sheet. You, you want to talk about the balance sheet? We're doing so, and uh, we've said so far that uh, working capital is something we should be familiar with. Current ratio is something we should be familiar with. The quick or acid test ratio is something we should be familiar with. And then the last one is we look at our balance sheet here, and it looks like uh, we have in terms of total capital, 50 million capital running the business, plus our shareholder equity here of 40 million. You know, that's money we've left in the corporation as retained earnings, uh, money we raised from selling the stock, but our total capitalization is 90 million. So, you know, you want to compete against that. is uh, 90 million. And that is the bond money and the uh, net worth, the shareholder equity. And the last thing we wanna be able to do is determine how much of the money we're using to run the business is debt versus how much is equity. So what we wanna do is take our bond money here, which was 50 million, our long-term debt. And this is about solvency. You know, the other ones, these other ones were about liquidity, but this is about solvency going bankrupt, right? I mean, Toys R Us went bankrupt, Sears went bankrupt, Kmart went bankrupt. Don't get me wrong, you know, Toys R Us, I'll pick on Toys R Us. I understand that it's difficult selling toys against Amazon and Walmart, but it doesn't help that they have billions of dollars on their balance sheet. And so they have a large portion of their balance sheet is debt. And that means it's going to be a more challenging business because not only do they have to sell enough toys to cover their operating costs. They also got to be able to pay their bondholders. They weren't be able to do it. And so, uh, you know, they went bye-bye. And so this is our last one here. And so we're going to take our long-term debt. I'm taking my calculator, 50 million. I'm going to divide by 90 million. And I find out that uh, 55 cents of every dollar uh, belongs to bondholders. And that's about financial flexibility, right? I was talking to my brother about financial flexibility. You know, uh, I have a lot of flexibility because I don't have a lot of debt, right? So, you know, I don't want to do something. I don't need to have, have to do it, right? What's that th th saying people have? I, I owe, I owe, so off to work I go. <laughs> you know, so, um, I'm joking, but right. But if you don't owe anybody, you know, you're going to be a little more laid back about uh, what's happening. Uh, any uh, any other questions you might have on this balance sheet, Daisy? I think that's what I did. I think is very sufficient, if not overkill for both the exams. But uh, just make sure. Let me just review here with you. Uh, I want to just review real quick. I told you mainly it's recognition, but they could ask you. You definitely want to know working capital. So let's put that. Do we want to be able to do that on the test? We definitely want to know current ratio. We definitely want to know this one, right? Um, this is a little lower probability. Uh, this is an answer set I should be comfortable with. And uh, I think that's uh, pretty sufficient. Anything else uh, on the balance sheet? No, but I was going to ask you, okay, so that cap, where you have capitalization equity plus long-term debt. Yeah, so the way I got the 90 million, let's just get the here. I took the long-term debt and I added the shareholder equity called net worth. And that's where I got that 90 million. So that's how much money is running this business. So, you know, I, I was talking to my friend, Brian, the test geek, and I'm the series seven guru. And, you know, both of us have said, we don't want to compete against STC and pass perfect and Kaplan and, uh, you know, Solomon, but let's say Dean decided to come out of retirement. I decide to compete. Well, that means I'm going to need some capital, right? It's one thing selling tutoring for a couple hundred bucks an hour. It's quite another to hire employees and, get a Q bank. And so what I would want to do is see, okay, well, what is the capitalization of my competitors? How much money do they have? Kaplan is huge. It's a subsidiary of uh, Graham Holdings, right? So, you know, it doesn't mean I can't compete with them. It just means they have more resources than I do. And then again, if we're, you know, doing fundamental analysis, we then would take this uh, balance sheet of ABC and compare, uh, chain, uh, compare it to its competitors, right? So if I'm doing a fundamental analysis on Coke, I'm going to look at Pepsi's balance sheet and see what the similarities are and what the differences are. So that's where I got that 90 million. Uh, by the way, as I said, there's a difference between liquidity and solvency. Liquidity means, you know, I just don't have a bunch of cash right now. 
you know, by the way, if I was having a liquidity cri crisis, I could very easily just take one of my long-term assets. Maybe I sell my land for 15 million and then now that 15 million will go into working capital, right? So, you know, that's different than being bankrupt, right? So what started as a liquidity problem at Silicon Valley Bank started as a liquidity problem. They just didn't have enough liquidity and they started selling some assets. And then it ended up being a solvency problem, right? That means they went bankrupt. That's a different thing. Uh, First Republic, they've been able to get enough liquidity to continue to conduct business, right? So <laughs> yeah, they're, worried, they're worried again about solvency, right? Now they you know, they're, 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 they have liquidity, so they're different things. So um, well, I'm hinting at that if I ask you uh, about one of these not being about liquidity, it would be this one. Let's call this choice D. And this one is about solvency of a company, bankruptcy, where the others are about liquidity. Any other questions on this balance sheet? No. Uh, Dean, do you think this would be useful to maybe add those, like the um, formulas to our scratch sheet during our yeah, test? Yeah, it depends on seven. I don't think you're going to, you know, you could certainly mm -hmm. uh, on 6566. I have an entire lecture I did on this that includes a discussion of the income statement as well. And I'll link that in the replay for you. So uh, I'll put that link there. But I've, uh, I, the reason I covered it, it's always a, a thing. Uh, I think, Daisy, was it you that asked to go over this? Yes. So you know what happens? I'm just going to tease Daisy a little bit. If I didn't go over this, she would swear to us that she had 130 balance sheet questions. I wouldn't believe her, but you know, uh, this is in the uh, area called analytical tools on the test specifications. But the other reason I believe in going over it is I told you when I was talking to Brian, the other reason I believe in going over this is it's in the same category as uh, present value, future value, internal rates of return, that kind of stuff. And I personally find this Daisy to be easier math-wise than some of the other stuff. So, you know, I think if you can get this down now on your seven, uh, working capital does show up. I mean, they do ask that. It's not a big a deal, but uh, you know, again, balance sheet is testable. And then I said, the other thing that's testable is if we're engaged in this. So another thing that's testable is uh, some of us start with a, the economy and then we pick the industry and then we look at a stock like ABC. Others of us start by looking at ABC, and after we do our analysis here on a fundamental level, we look at the industry they're in and look at their competitors, and then we look uh, next at the economy. So this is, again, more of a test question on 65, 66, but uh, if we start by looking at the economy and then the industry and then the company, what is that called? That's called top-down analysis. Right. I always think of Mr. Buffett. He starts with his economic a forecast. Then he says what industry should be in. And then he goes, buys an oil company or a transportation company or whatever it happens to be. What if I start with the company? Then I had to make a just look at the industry and then I look at the economy. What would that be called? Bottom up. Bottom up, right? So we either have top down or bottom up, depending on what kind of a practitioner we are. Uh, anything else on the balance sheet? So answer your question, I, I would be able to recognize these formulas. So if you're using a data dump sheet and you have formulas, I don't have like a formula page when I'm doing a data dump. Uh, I'm agnostic about whether you want to do one. I would put my, I like to put my formulas where I need them. And so, you know, I would have a little section of my data dump sheet where I have, you know, maybe a balance sheet. The other thing uh, that we need to know is the classical balance sheet equation, which is assets, 100 million, minus liabilities, 50 million, equals net worth 40 million. So you definitely need to know that classical balance sheet equation. Uh, please note it's ba a balance sheet because both sides balance, right? Here we have 100 million and here we have 100 million. That's why it's called a balance sheet because both sides balance. All right, so uh, what else would you guys like to talk about today? Anything else in this uh, office hour? <laughs> I have one more, Dean, if, sure, if anyone, sure. um, I did, did want to go over quickly um, DPPs and the difference between those and um, REITs. Okay, so let me get a whiteboard again. Oh. Uh, 
All right. Is the whiteboard showing up for you guys? Uh, yes. Okay. So uh, I think of uh, my tax return as having three buckets or three baskets. You know. And so one basket or bucket on my tax return is going to be my paycheck income. This is Dean working for money. Right? This is Dean tutoring. This is Dean teaching Kaplan classes, whatever. And then I have my portfolio. That's my money working for me. And then I have uh, what's called passive. That's my partnerships. You know, a portfolio, just, you know, the, what the IRS calls the paycheck earned income is earned income. Me working for money. And then my portfolio is called unearned income. I don't know why. I mean, hazarding my capital is not a concern to uh, be that. And, you know, I was, uh, you know, told, having conversations, I told you, with a big mucky muck, a Kaplan guy. And he said, well, Dina, you know, well, we think there may be a conflict of interest for you to, you know, uh, be doing things that you're doing. And, you know, we're, we're, we, you have permission to do it. I said, well, I'm glad because I don't really need permission, guys. I mean, I'm not an employee. I'm an independent contractor. And uh, I don't make enough money from Kaplan for it to be worthwhile. The way they remove the conflict is for me just to resign. They go, oh, no, don't do that. <laughs> but I'm kind of like telling them, that, listen, if you look back, guys, on what I've made teaching classes for you, it's not significant enough for me to be worried about it. And I do it because I enjoy it. And, you know, if you, you're not enjoying it anymore and I'm not enjoying it anymore, well, then maybe it's time to, to move on. Uh, kind of the same thing. I mean, to be honest with you, that 35 bucks tomorrow is not meaningful to me, but uh, I like to put a, some kind of a price on it. But, you know, whether people will sign up or not. Anyways, that's me working for money. And I kind of consider myself to be semi-retired and very fortunate and blessed that I have enough money working for me. And that's kind of the game, right? We want to get enough money working for us that we don't need to work for our money anymore. I mean, that that's the ideal thing, place to arrive at. I used to get a real kick out of calling my customer and saying, we've arrived at our financial destination. And so if you don't want to go to work tomorrow, you can call in instead of calling in sick, you can call in rich. You can say, hey, I'm not coming into work. I got an eye problem. They go, what's wrong with your eye? You say, I can't see coming to work. Uh, I was joking, Cynthia. There's all kinds of men and women of fidelity who are choosing to come to work that don't need to. They got enough stocked away and all those fidelity accounts, you know, <laughs> and have those fathom shares. Now, you asked about the difference between a REIT and a partnership. Partnerships are called direct participation programs. And so, AKA partnerships. So there's, you know, that language is the same. And so uh, the REIT is going to be over here in your portfolio. And you would buy a REIT for the same reasons you would buy a mutual fund. You know, you buy a REIT for the same reasons you buy a mutual fund. Professional management. Diversification. And ease of ownership. That's the same reason you buy a mutual fund. Now, in a mutual fund, you're buying a portfolio of real estate, or excuse me, securities. But in a REIT, you are buying a portfolio, proportion ownership of a portfolio of real estate. And one big difference between mutual funds and REITs is REITs and mutual funds mass pass through 90% of their net investment income, not losses. They don't flow through losses. They only flow through income. And that is a testable distinction between a REIT and a direct participation program. A direct participation program passes through both losses and gains. It passes through its income, as well as, in fact, this is called passive income. The money you receive from your partnerships is called passive income, but they also might be passing through to you. Instead of passive income, they might also be passing through passive losses. So we'll put that in green, uh, but your partnership may have a loss and that too will pass through. And losses do not flow through on a REIT. So if you have a partnership that owns real estate, that's entirely different than owning a REIT. 
uh, P.S. Uh, let's say the dean made uh, eighty thousand uh, dollars in working for money. That's my paycheck earned income. And uh, let's say that uh, I my portfolio lost money. My portfolio lost money. So let's say this year my portfolio had a loss of uh, twenty thousand dollars. I net all my gains, all my losses, and I had a twenty thousand dollar loss. Can I reduce that uh, paycheck income? Can I reduce that paycheck income? Can I bring losses? Can I bring losses from my portfolio to my paycheck? Yes or no? Can I actually take yes. anything? How much? Can I take of the 20,000? I've netted all my gains and losses. I have a $20,000 loss. So what can I reduce my uh, paycheck by? 3,000. Right. So yeah. So now I'm going to tell the IRS that I didn't make 80. I'm going to tell the IRS that I made 77. And now that means I have some money left over here. Uh, so I used uh, three of the 20. So that's no 20 any longer. That's now 17. What do I do with that 17? I carry it forward to next year and maybe next year I can use it. Uh, one more point here. In the partnerships, the REITs go into this portfolio bucket and the this uh, third bucket is its own bucket and nothing from that bucket can move anywhere. So in my example, maybe you have partnerships passing through to you $20,000 in losses. And so if you have a passive activity losses from your partnerships of $20,000, there is nothing you can do with that loss except match it up with uh, passive income. That money is stuck over there. You know, one of my largest commissions, I've been pretty blessed, but one of my largest commissions was a $24,000 commission and I was giving the doctor a due diligence tour and tasting of the winery. And uh, when we got done with our due diligence tour and tasting, we were walking back down to his car and he said, Dean, I appreciate what I've learned so far. He says, it's kind of uh, embarrassing, but I'm going to take a pass. He says, I have all kinds of passive activity losses because I bought all these tax shelters and I've got, you know, all this money, passive activity losses. So, you know, I'm going to take a, a, a pass on this thing. I said, well, doctor, as you know, those passive losses are stuck over there in that bucket on your tax return and you can't do anything with them. And actually, now that you told me, I'm so glad you did because our partnership uh, passes, uh, distributes to you passive income. And so what you need to do is take advantage of those losses by getting some passive income. And so I think you should invest $300,000 in the winery because the $300,000 in the winery would uh, throw a pass through to you $20,000 in passive income that you could use to match up with your passive activity losses. And so this becomes a suitability question about somebody who has a passive loss or passive income about what we might recommend. So for example, let's say you have passive income. You know, you have passive income. And I call you and I say, hey, Cynthia, I think we should be a little aggressive here because you know we have that passive income so, you know, uh, if we do have a passive activity loss, it's not all bad news because we can use the passive activity loss against our passive income. So here's what I'm recommending to you. I think we should do an oil and gas exploratory wildcat program. You know, hopefully we find oil. I mean, no, but if we don't, at least we can what? Use that passive loss against our what? Passive, passive income. income. So, you know, sometimes I have a suitability question where, a customer has a large amount of passive income or passive losses, and what would be the partnership that would balance that out? All right. Uh, any other questions? So the main main test question and answer to your co original question is: REITs don't pass through losses, and partnerships do. All right. Uh, the other thing I would know is that REITs can be traded; they're liquid. If it's a traded REIT, we have two versions of REITs, but more on the test, they're traded, meaning there's a secondary market. A uh, REIT I owned for many years was called Boston Properties, BXP. They own commercial real estate, and you guessed it, Boston, New York, and Chicago. And it trades like a stock. So anytime I want, I can just call my broker and sell it. 
not true of a partnership. Partnerships, test question, are not liquid. You can't get in or out of a partnership without the permission of the general partner. So that's another major distinction between a REIT and a partnership. You should def definitely know that partnerships are not liquid. You can't get in or out of a partnership without the GP's permission. Uh, anything else for today's office hour? Can you look at the income one? Uh, let's see, uh, the income quickly. Uh, income isn't as testable. So here's our balance sheet. Can you guys see the balance sheet? Yes, no. Can you guys see the income statement yeah. one? Yes. So you, you, you probably refer, heard this referred to before, the top line. The top line. You know, even though the fidelity is privately held, they still uh, share their finances with folks. And, uh, you know, boy, looking at an income statement of fidelity is, woo, the top line is revenue, billions, right? And then we have expenses. So, you know, again, it's the same with the customer, right? What's your top line here? And then we're hoping the bottom line is black and not red. So we have sales and then we have expenses. That gives us our operating income. Uh, we, some uh, firms have gross margins that are pretty good and some not so good. You know, but our gross margin, remember, doesn't take into account that we got to pay our bonds, we got to pay the IRS. So we have other expenses besides our uh, expenses related to our sales. Uh, that gives us our net income, and that net income is available uh, either as retained earnings or to pay a dividend. So the board now gets together and says, we have net income of, you know, maybe we say, I'll just make up a number. So our bottom line is 20 million. Our bottom line is 20 million. And we say, do we want to keep the entire 20 million as retained earnings to build the business? Or do we want to keep a portion of it and distribute some of it to our shareholders? Do we want to declare a dividend? I say, hey, listen, uh, board members, why don't we bring in the chief financial officer before we make this decision? And we call them in and we say, hey, listen, uh, we're thinking about declaring a dividend. And we know that if we declare the dividend, it's going to become a current liability and it's gonna cause our uh, working capital to go down. So we just wanna make sure we're liquid enough that we can you know, pay this dividend and we don't have any issues there. Chief financial officer says, I got all the cash I need, it's not a problem. I say, okay, so board members, I'm thinking we need to decide what is gonna be our dividend payout ratio? How much of this net income uh, are we going to distribute as a dividend? Now we would expect a mature, stable business to pay us more money you know, as a payout ratio. And so I remember I said, if you can't remember to do what to do, you're going to be doing math. And so I'm just going to add some more numbers here. And uh, another number I'm going to add to this is how many shares outstanding we have, because what we really need to know is earnings per share. So I just told you that we have $20 million in net income. We're trying to decide how much of that we're going to pay out. And let's say that uh, we have 20 million in net income and we have 10 million shares outstanding. $20 million in net income, we have 10 million shares outstanding. And so that example, I'm not gonna make you do this, but we have earnings per share of $2. And so we're trying to decide how much of that uh, earnings we're gonna pay as a dividend. And I say, you know what I think would be fair is we pay out half of it. Why don't we take half of the 20 million, 10, and pay that or declare that as a dividend? And so we've decided we're going to declare a dividend of a dollar. And that's our dividend. And so here, the dividend payout ratio. And again, the higher that payout ratio, the more mature, stable business that we think it is. And in this example, the dividend payout ratio is 50%. That's called the dividend payout ratio. Uh, the other thing we need to know is PE, price to earnings. And so we said that we have uh, $2 in earnings per share. And so let's say that our stock price is $20. So the current market price of our stock is $20. And we have earnings per share of two. So what is the price to earnings ratio if we have a $20 stock price and we have earnings of $2? What is our P-E ratio? 10 to what? 
And uh, we use that again to make comparisons amongst companies. And I would know about the PE ratio. All right, so uh, we're on the end of our, we ran a little over on our office hour, don't mind that. Anything else on the income statement? Was that you again, Daisy? Is there anything else you wanna know about this income statement? No, that was it. Okay. Uh, one other thing I just wanna add a little bit, uh, just remember that depreciation is a non-cash expense. It doesn't show up here as a related to the company, but you series sevens in partnerships would does show up and depreciation is a non-cash expense. So if we were looking for cash flow, we would toss out whatever they tell us the depreciation is. Okay, so uh, I what I do, just so you know, I think I've explained this, uh, but we actually do the um, office hours based on when they get filled. And so I think this one is filled and there means it's not showing up. And then what I'll do is open up another one. So be looking and I will be opening up another office hour, first come, first serve. I try and keep it to five folks because, you know, otherwise we don't want to turn it into a live stream or, you know, the overtime session. We want to have enough time to do what we did, which is, you know, cover in depth anything that people want to talk about. So anyways, I'll open that up, be looking for that. And uh, Cynthia, let's see, I think it's Daisy. Uh, I always, for, for tutoring people, I will, you know, open that up, even if it's five and you're a tutor person, you will always be able to access the free stuff. I'll manually put you in there. All right, anything else? Okay, everybody, I'll see you for the next office hour. If I don't see you for live stream or live stream overtime, there is no overtime session tonight, but there is Tuesday and that has a couple spots left in it. I don't know if you guys have participated in overtime very much like this, except it's uh, got more 10 people in it and it follows our live stream this evening. We're not doing it this evening, but we are gonna do it next Tuesday. All right, remember inch by inch, your exam's a cinch, yard by yard, your exam is hard and I'll see you next time. Any last minute things before we call it a day? No, appreciate everything. You bet, Thank Caesar. You, you bet. You, you bet. My pleasure, guys. See you next time. Bye bye. Have a good night.